Hello, Janesville. Thanks for tuning in to Park Place Views. I'm Maggie Herdlicka, Management Information Specialist for the City of Janesville. During this monthly program, I sit down and highlight the exciting programs, the important projects, and the great people of your city government, the City of Janesville. Thanks, as always, to JATV for helping us provide this program. Last month, I sat down with City Assessor Richard Haviza and we talked about the property assessment process. And boy, I'll tell you, there was a lot to talk about with the property assessment process. So if you missed that program and you'd like to view it, you can find it on our website on the publications and videos page. You can also go to YouTube and, and find JATV's YouTube channel and find it there. But today, I'm talking to the Janesville Transit System, in particular, Transit Director Dave Muma and Assistant Transit Director Rebecca Smith. Dave began um, working at the city of Janesville in 1979. However, he's been in the bus transportation industry since 1970. He worked in Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. But when he started in Janesville in 1979, he was hired as the Assistant Transit Superintendent. And then in 1980, he was promoted to transit director, where he has been serving ever since. So 34 years in this position. And Rebecca Smith was hired at the city of Janesville in 2003 as community information specialist. She was later promoted to management assistant in the city manager's office in 2007. And just last year, 2013, she moved over to the transit, uh, Janesville transit system where she was um, hired as assistant transit director, and she's been serving there for nearly a year now. Welcome to the program, Dave and Rebecca. Thank you guys so much for being here. We appreciate the opportunity to learn about JTS. Thanks for having us, Maggie. No problem. Um, I talked a little bit about your employment history at the city of Janesville, but can each of you tell me a little bit more about yourselves? Dave, why don't you go first? Well, as you mentioned, I've been involved in the in the bus transportation industry for 44 years, and it seems like an awfully long time when you actually say that. And uh, began actually as a part-time job when I was uh, attending college and getting a degree in history, where I planned to be a high school history teacher. Uh, the part-time job turned into a full-time avocation, and here I am, 44 years later, still in the bus transportation industry, but with a great interest in history going on, too. Yeah. Um, I arrived in Janesville in uh, 1979, and three months after I walked in the door, the individual who was the transit director at the time left. So I hardly knew my way up in the city of Janesville, and now I was thrown into the job of uh, operating the transit system. So that was, uh, as the saying goes, drinking from a fire hose very quickly when, when I first got to the community. Great. How about you, Rebecca? Oh, sure. I um, got my start in public administration when I was a city intern when I was an undergrad, and I quickly learned that I really liked working for local government and public service and kind of knew that's where I wanted to spend my career. I started at the city of Janesville more than 10 years ago and have very much enjoyed my time here at the city and was very excited to come to Janesville Transit almost a year ago now. Great. Well, again, thank you both for being here. So now, Dave, I recall that hearing that public transit has been in Janesville for over 100 years. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? How has it evolved over that time? Sure. Uh, 128 years ago, actually, this past uh, July, uh, the first horse-drawn streetcar trundled down North Academy Street in Janesville, and that began uh, the public transit service in the city. At that time, uh, public transit here, as it was in most places around the country, was a private for-profit business and continued that way for a number of years. Uh, the horse-drawn streetcars were replaced by electric trolleys in 1892, and uh, then buses came along in 1929. At that time, it, people might find it interesting that the electric utility, Wisconsin Power and Light, actually was the operator of the transit service in Janesville, and they actually ran transit systems in several cities around Wisconsin. Uh, the city got into the act in 1953 uh, after the exit of WPNL. Uh, when the then private operator uh, ran out of money and uh, they uh, were about to go out of business. Uh, the city held a referendum back in 1953, and by an overwhelming vote of 3,300 to 545, 
the citizens voted that the city should take over and provide public transit service to the community. And so uh, the city government has been providing that service ever since. Okay, and since you've been here the last 35 years, how has JTS evolved in, in, in that time period? Janesville, of course, has changed uh, in the last 35 years. It's not the community that I moved into, and that's not to say that's bad. But there have been a lot of changes in our economy and the demographics of the community and the needs for transit service. Uh, going from being a basically dawn to dusk service from 6 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock at night. Uh, we have expanded to provide evening service uh, and we now operate till 10, 15 p.m. And then we've uh, opened two regional services over the years, one between Janesville and Beloit and another one more recently between Janesville, Milton and Whitewater. So as the community's needs have changed, as uh, the need for regional transportation has become evident, JTS has grown and changed with those needs. Interesting. Well, I'd like to learn a little bit more about JTS operations. Uh, Rebecca, would you tell us a little bit about the staffing of JTS? Sure. Uh, Janesville Transit employs 39 individuals. We have individuals in administration and customer service folks who um, perform maintenance and custodial services to make sure our buses keep running. And then of course we have our bus operators or what we call bus drivers. Um, and I can tell you that in 2013, we provided more than a half, um, half million rides to the public. And if it wasn't for our customer service folks, our people that keep our buses going in maintenance and our drivers themselves, we would be able to provide that level of service. Okay. So can you tell me how, where does the funding come from to pay for this operation? Sure. About 31% of our funding comes from the federal government. About 24% of our funding comes from the state of Wisconsin. Individuals that ride our buses and pay their fares provide about 15% of our funding. And the city of Janesville taxpayers pay about 23% of our funding. Okay, so that explains where the money comes from. So how is it spent within your operation then? Oh, sure. We um, have supplies and materials, contractual services. The largest area of service or um, type of spending we have is our personal services to pay for all the individuals in the division. Okay. Well, I know you guys have um, some special services that you provide above and beyond just the normal, um, you know, bus ridership for, for the community. So I'd like to learn a little bit more about some of those. And Dave, you alluded to the regional service that you provide, um, in particular the Beloit Janesville Express and the Janesville Milton Whitewater Innovation Express. So can you just tell me a little bit about, about those services? Why did you start providing them and, and who are the primary riders on those services? Certainly. Uh, the Beloit Janesville Express actually dates back to the uh, establishment of the Blackhawk Technical College Central Campus uh, between Janesville and Beloit which happened back in 1977. And at the time, there was an attempt made to serve that central campus uh, with bus service, and for various reasons, it wasn't successful. Um, we joined together with the city of Beloit in 1983 uh, and took another shot at it, so to speak, uh, for about a six-month period. But again, the, the, the chemistry wasn't there, and, and it didn't, uh, didn't work. Um, but the idea of the service and the need for the service didn't go away. And so in 1987, uh, we joined together again with the city of Beloit uh, and also with uh, Black Hawk Technical College, UW Rock County, and uh, Can Do Industries and what was at that time called the Private Industry Council, which was a job training uh, organization that existed back then, to uh, form the Beloit Janesville Express Service as we know it today. Because Wisconsin does not uh, have any type of regional transportation uh, funding that can be put together by local governments, uh, each of these sponsors, which now has grown to seven sponsors uh, for the Boyd Janesville Express, uh, contribute to what would be considered the local portion of the funding of the service. So we still get federal and state funding for the service. Uh, the, the riders obviously contribute passenger fares, but then each of those seven sponsors for the Beloit Janesville Express uh, contribute financially to help support the service. And uh, that, you know, 
has been very, very important to keep it viable. About 60,000 people every year, on the average, ride the Beloit Janesville Express between the two communities and to the various institutions. But it's not just about the sponsors. Uh, the sponsors realize that everyone who gets on the bus and pays a fare uh, helps to support that service. So the public is uh, always welcome and always invited to ride that service. We have a similar situation with the much more recently established Janesville Milton Whitewater Service. Uh, this dates back to uh, about 2008 when uh, there had been a lot of conversation about having service in the Highway 59 corridor between Janesville Milton and over to Whitewater. Uh, obviously, as most folks know, uh, there's a very large state university in Whitewater. What some people don't know is there's also quite a large industrial park in Whitewater with many businesses that employ quite a few people. Uh, Milton, of course, also has industries, and most recently, uh, the Blackhawk Technical College has established their advanced manufacturing campus in Milton. All of this provides an impetus for us to serve this corridor, and the Janesville City Council recognized that there were job opportunities there for Janesville citizens, as well as job training opportunities at the institutions of higher education. So the council was very supportive of us establishing that service. And again, we use the same model there that we do with the Beloit Janesville Express, where in this case we have four sponsors who help to underwrite the local share of that service, including a private sector manufacturer, Generac Power Systems, as well as the university and the cities of Milton and Whitewater. And uh, we are still building that service. Uh, our ridership last year on that service was uh, about 49,000 passenger trips in the course of the year. And uh, we look to continue to work with the cities and the institutions to continue to refine and build the Janesville Milton Whitewater Innovation Express. But I think it's very important and it's interesting, one of our local legislators uh, happened to ride the bus earlier this year. And he asked the people riding, you know, where are you going? Well, about 90% of the people on the bus were going to work. And that says a lot because that means we're connecting people with jobs. And then he asked the second question, well, if this bus didn't run, uh, would you be able to hold this job? And about 70% of the people on the bus said no. So again, for someone in the public transit business, that makes me feel really good that we're connecting people with something as essential as their job and their ability to make an income by having that service in place. Great, yeah, sounds like a great cooperative program. Um, Rebecca, I know that you also, uh, JTS also provides certain services for Janesville students. Can you talk a little bit about those programs? Absolutely. Um, during the school year, in the mornings and afternoons, Janesville, um, Janesville Transit provides what we like to call extra service routes. So these are extra routes in the morning and afternoon during our peak times when middle school, high school, and others are trying to get around town. Um, these extra service routes, if let's say you're a parent or um, a middle, high, middle school student or high school student, you want to get to your school, you can go ahead and ride these extra routes in the mornings and afternoons during the school year. Another really great program we have for middle school and high school students is what we call our Youth Token Program. This program was uh, implemented in the fall of 2013 and allows middle school and high school students to purchase uh, bus fare tokens at half price. So this means students can get to school or to or from school every day, as well as anywhere else they need to go um, in Janesville for half price. The students can purchase um, the tokens right at their schools, and this program has been very, very popular. In 2013, we provided more than 43,000 extra service trip rides. And already here in 2014, we've provided more than 34,000 rides. So this service is growing, and we're very happy to work with the school district at Janesville on this youth token program. We feel the program reduces truancy and provides a safe and reliable way for students to get around town and to get to school. Great. Another great program. So how about um, the services that you provide for individuals with disabilities in the community? Oh, sure. Uh, Janesville Transit has a long, a long standing and quality working relationship with individuals that have disabilities or special needs. 
all of our GTS buses are equipped to be, provide um, access for two wheelchairs at a time on the buses. If an individual has a certified disability or if you're a, a senior citizen, you can ride all of our Jamesville Transit um, trips for half price. And if someone has such a level of disability that they're not able to ride a regular Jamesville Transit bus, they can get certified and receive what we call paratransit service. Paratransit service is door-to-door um, -door dial a ride service, and we contract with Rock County Transit to provide that level of service. Okay. And Dave, something that you mentioned a little bit earlier is the nightside or evening service that, that you provide and, and have been providing since 2000. And I understand that that program has some unique features to it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and it, it is a unique service. We do this with what's called route deviation. And what this does, it allows us to cover the entire community, but do it with only three buses in the evening hours. But it also is uh, designed to provide a greater level of flexibility and safety uh, to the people who are riding the bus. Uh, the three routes take an hour in the evening to, uh, to make their trips around the community one to the east side, one to the north side, and one to the west and south sides of Janesville. Uh, in the course of the route, if uh, one of the passengers on the bus needs to go to a location that's some distance off the route, the driver is allowed to deviate off the route up to one-third of a mile uh, to take that customer to or closer to uh, their destination. We feel that's important, particularly during the hours of darkness and uh, in lousy weather in the wintertime uh, for safety uh, to get people uh, closer to their destination or to go closer to where they are located to pick them up. And we have a dispatcher that works in the evening that uh, will take telephone calls from intending passengers uh, requesting a route deviation. The dispatcher checks to make sure it's within our area and then we'll send a radio message to the bus driver uh, instructing them to go pick the individual up. And uh, it's been a very successful service. Uh, the ridership is around 20,000 passengers a year. But again, for those people that need that service, it's extremely important. I think one of the s stories that I've heard that, again, as a public transit person, makes me really feel good about the service we provide is a woman who a number of years ago was uh, living in the House of Mercy, uh, which was a women's shelter and uh, was able to get a job at one of the local retailers in second shift. And uh, because of the nightside service, uh, she was able to hold the job and then get home in the evening uh, after, uh, after work, uh, which she wouldn't have been able to do under uh, other circumstances and uh, wouldn't have been able to be employed that way. So again, as a public transit provider, uh, that type of thing really makes me feel good and uh, about the type of service that we provide to the community. Yeah, that is a good story. And, and all those programs we just talked about, they seem like really great community resources for different groups that are possibly underserved in the community. So great job. Just to, to change gears a little bit here, uh, back in August, I know you guys moved into your new Transit Services Center, which is the Operations and Maintenance Facility for the Janesville Transit System. So Rebecca, do you feel settled into your new home? Oh, I would say absolutely. We have a few small things yet to be done, of course, after a big move such as the one we just made, but we're all very, um, very, very excited and very thankful to be in our new building. Great. And Dave, can you just talk a little bit about why JTS needed a new home? What was wrong with the old building? The transit system had been located at 900 North Parker Drive since 1965 and actually moved at that time into a public works building that had been built a few years before. And uh, by the late 70s, uh, we had really outgrown that facility. And so uh, the city at that time actually made a fundamental decision as to whether they were going to continue to have a public transit system or not. Mm. They decided to do that. Uh, received the first of many federal grants that we've uh, obtained over the years to uh, buy new buses, to buy the first passenger shelters, and to add an addition onto the 1961 building. Uh, that was 35 years ago, just before I showed up in Janesville, as a matter of fact, that that all happened. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, 
that 1979 edition was getting ready for some renovations. And uh, I, in preparing my budget, approached the then city manager and, uh, with that proposal. And he says, well, let's think about the future. What are you going to be doing 20 years from now, 30 years from now? And the result of that exploration really led us to uh, the project that we've just completed. Uh, one of the things we found out, for example, was that the property at 900 North Parker only consisted of just slightly over two and a half acres, some of which was a hillside. And uh, our ability to expand on that property was nil. Uh, we needed a larger area to fulfill our needs looking forward for the next 50 years. So ultimately, there were 19 sites around the community that were studied before we picked the site at the corner of Parker and Blackbridge, which formerly was part of the Parker Pen Company. We have five acres on that corner, so over twice the amount of property that we had. And uh, as I mentioned, we built the facility really to serve the community's needs for the next 50 years. When we looked back, we saw that the city uses its major facilities for at least that long. So we wanted to be sure, among other things, that when we built it, we number one, did the job right, and number two, that we did it in such a way that we weren't coming back to the taxpayers a few years later saying, oops, now we need to meet, make, add more space. So that was really the driving force behind that. We had no idea at the time, back in 2003, that it was going to be a 12-year process mm -hmm. to get the new building built. But thanks to three federal transportation grants, uh, which funded 84% of the cost of the building, as well as local bonding that uh, covered the other 16%, uh, we now are in a wonderful new uh, 43,000 square foot facility that will serve the needs of Janesville citizens for the next half century. Great. And you mentioned a little bit about the taxpayers and, and the funding. Rebecca, can you tell us a little bit, uh, what was the total project cost? I know this has been kind of a hot topic among residents and the media. Oh, absolutely. So the total cost for the project was $7.95 million. That included the site acquisition, the design, construction of the building, and then some of the furnishings that were needed. As Dave mentioned, we did receive three federal grants for the project, equaling about 83.5% of the project costs. And then the city of Janesville did provide uh, the rest of the remaining funding. Um, Janesville Transit, you know, we're very pleased and proud to be in our new building. And we feel that um, we are very pleased we're able to bring these federal dollars into Janesville for this project and be able to support various local and regional, regional um, businesses and contractors as we designed and constructed this building. Okay. And, you know, I had the opportunity to tour the, the new building. And it seems like there is a lot of functionality in this building that the old one did not have. Um, and you mentioned that it was built to, to last for the next 50 years and, and be ready for the future. Can you talk just a little bit about the, some of the features that the new building has that will improve efficiency for your operation as well as potentially improve services for residents? The new Transit Services Center is designed, first of all, to uh, increase the efficiency of our administrative staff. Uh, we had four people working in an office that was really designed for two administrators in the old building. Uh, Becca and another supervisor shared the same office and made it very difficult when you're trying to have a private meeting with an employee, you have to kick your office mate out or something like that. Um, we also have much improved training facilities in the new building for our employees. Uh, we, as a matter of fact, we had a training session this morning for them using uh, modern technology with video and, and uh, things of that nature that we simply weren't able to do in the old facility. Uh, also from the standpoint of maintaining the fleet because our buses average somewhere around 60 to 70,000 miles a year, uh, fleet maintenance is uh, very, very important to service reliability. Uh, so we have a new straight through, if you will, um, bus servicing, washing, and, and parking facility uh, that is a lot more efficient than our old setup where in the wintertime after the buses were washed, they had to be driven outside. And uh, as you can imagine, with all the water streaming off the buses, leaving the wash, we had a skating rink. made it very difficult. And the cramped old bus parking garage required 
two people, one to drive the bus and one to make sure they weren't hitting anything when they parked the bus, where now one person can simply drive the bus into the storage area and pull it into a parking stall, and they're done. Um, and our new maintenance area has five service bays compared to the three that we had in the old garage. And again, uh, that increases the efficiency of our uh, area. We have about twice the parts storage that we did in the old facility. And uh, that makes uh, a big difference, too, in being able to maintain an adequate stock of repair parts to keep the buses on the road. Okay, well, you know, from my limited experience in there, it does seem like a very nice but functional building. And, and folks at home, if you're interested in touring the new Transit Services Center, um, I know that JTS is happy to provide those tours at any time. Um, just please give them a call in advance and set up a time to come over and see the new building for yourself. So just changing tracks a little bit again. Um, no pun intended. I really didn't, <laughs> didn't really intend that pun. Um, I'd just like to ask some questions about uh, JTS day-to-day -day operations that you know, some of our viewers at home might be wondering if they're going to ride the bus for the first time or if they're existing bus riders who just have questions. So, um, you know, first, Dave, looking at your website, there are a ton of different rates for someone who wants to ride the bus. So can you just go over some of the main fares that are either the most popular or the most used um, for just for simplicity for our viewers at home? Certainly. Uh, and we do have a lot of fares, and it is and can be confusing to people. As we mentioned earlier, for example, by federal law, we're required to offer half fares for certain groups of people. So there's a whole set of fares that are just designed for persons with disabilities or persons over the age of 65. Uh, our basic cash fare in the city of Janesville is $1.75. That's for a passenger that over the age of our age of five or over, I should say, who gets on the bus and wants to travel completely inside the city. Uh, I'd mention, by the way, that our fares are set by city ordinance. Uh, the transit director does not dream these up and then foist them on the public. Uh, they do have to go through the ordinance review process with the city council, including a public hearing, and then the council actually votes and acts on these fares, so they are established by council action. Um, we also offer discounted fares uh, by way of purchasing token packs. For example, a pack of 10 single ride tokens sells for $14.50, and if you do the math in your head, you figure out that's less than 10 rides paying cash at $17.50. And we also sell a monthly pass, which goes for $52.00 for unlimited rides in the course of a month. And the break-even point on that pass versus paying cash is at about 30 rides. So someone who's commuting on a daily basis, back and forth to work, back and forth to school, uh, you know, that provides a good value for that individual. Uh, we also have uh, fares for our regional services, uh, and we have passes that are available for all the regional services. So we invite folks to look into our, uh, our brochures that has that information, or they can certainly call us or look at the website to see what the different fares are. Uh, the most expensive pass that we have right now is a monthly commuter pass for folks working in Whitewater, and that's $130 a month for unlimited rides between Janesville and Whitewater. Okay. And, and similarly, I know that your... Um, routes can be complex, but can, in fact, Rebecca, can you give a, just an overview of, of the in-city routes? Sure, absolutely. So Monday through Friday, we provide service for 16 hours a day. For the first 12 hours, 6.15 a.m. to 6.15 p.m., we have all of our regular routes going. And then as we talked about a little bit earlier, starting at 6.15 Monday through Friday, we offer our nightside service until 10.15 p.m. On Saturdays, we do have um, routes available during the, um, during the day, not at night. And then also during the week, Monday through Friday, we have our Beloit Janesville Express route. And then we have our Janesville Milton Whitewater route peppered all seven days of the week. Okay, do you have any um, safety or convenience tips for someone who's riding the bus for the first time? Oh, sure. 
Um, well, I think the most important thing is to be on time or to be early to your bus stop. If you're late, you very well could miss the bus and have to wait for the next one. Here in Janesville, we, um, in the vast majority of the city, we can pick up at any safe intersection. In some communities, you have to be as a des at a designated bus stop sign to be picked up. But here in Janesville, we can be picked up. You can be picked up at any safe intersection. So you don't necessarily need to be by a bus stop sign. I would also encourage um, riders as you're waiting on the side of the street and you see the bus coming, just give a wave to the driver or make some eye contact that helps them know that indeed that's what you're waiting for. Um, I would also encourage any individual that likes bike riding to go ahead and consider getting um, certified to bring your bike on the bus. This would allow you to take advantage of the City of Janesville's bike trails while also riding JTS. And if anyone ever has any questions, by all means, we encourage citizens to call. We're happy to answer any question. I can guarantee probably any question someone calls with, we've probably been asked it before and are happy to answer it. Okay, great. Well, Dave and Rebecca, we covered a lot today, but I know we really just skimmed the surface of of the Janesville transit system. So um, for our viewers at home, if they would like to get more information about Janesville transit, how can they do that? Oh, sure. Well, um, if someone likes has a computer or likes going on the internet, all of our information about JTS is on our city website page. Um, if someone isn't as much into computers or doesn't like using the internet, we do have brochures that provide our information. You can pick up a free brochure at any of the grocers in town, all of the temporary staffing agencies in town have our brochures, um, the city buildings, and then we have about another 100 other locations around Janesville where you can get brochures. If someone has an email account, I really encourage them to join the city's email distribution list um, because then you can get up-to-date info about transit in case we have a temporary detour or construction project that might um, affect one of our routes. You can get information um, through those email lists. Great. And, and Dave, I understand that you plan to retire sometime in the near future. So is, is the date set? And um, when you retire, what are you going to do every day if you're not coming to work? Yes, as a matter of fact, after 35 years here, I do plan on retiring at the end of 2014. And uh, I have a number of different potential plans. Uh, I don't plan to be inactive and go fishing permanently. Uh, but uh, my wife and I do enjoy traveling and, uh, and getting around the country and visiting friends and relatives, so I'm sure we'll be doing some of that. And I do plan to stay active in, uh, in the transportation practice. I've spent time uh, working with various professional associations over my career, and I plan to continue to do that uh, as well as uh, stay active in the transportation industry following the end of my employment here in Janesville. Mm -hmm. Well, good luck to you, and thank you for your service. Well, I, we don't have much time left here, but I always like to close with some rapid-fire questions that allow us to get to know you guys a little bit better. So these are just for fun, but you have to answer quickly. So are you ready? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Dave, you're up first. So I know you're a transportation guy through and through. What's your favorite mode of transportation? Well, I was raised in the East originally, and I actually first began riding public transit on streetcars in Philadelphia when I was a small child, and it stuck, and so I am a train buff, and uh, you'll find me to be one of those people who goes out and likes to ride behind <laughs> steam locomotives and uh, take cross-country train trips, and that's one of the things that I hope to be able to do more of uh, when I'm retired. Good. I hope your wife's a good sport for that. And I also she comes know... along, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, good. I also know you're a history buff, so what's your favorite era to study? Well, as it happens, I had a distant relative whose farm was in the middle of the Antietam battlefield. And there is a town in Pennsylvania, actually, called Loomisburg, Pennsylvania, that's located five miles from Gettysburg. And my father was actually born and raised in that part of Pennsylvania. So uh, he and I were both uh, Civil War buffs. And uh, as a history student, uh, I've continued that interest and uh, take a lot of time visiting Civil War battlefields and, and other things like that. Something, again, that I hope to be able to do more of when I retire. Great. What's the best thing about your job? Um, I like serving people, and that's what public transit is all about. Uh, 
there are a lot of mechanical things that you do uh, in any job, and I'm not talking about just maintaining the buses, but things, tasks that you have to perform. But in the public transit industry, it all comes down to serving people and providing a service that connects people with important destinations. And I think when it comes right down to it, that's what keeps me going. That's what gets me in the office every morning is providing that service for people. Great. So, Dave, what's the one book everyone should read at least once in their life? Well, this is actually three books, and I've just mm -hmm. finished reading uh, Rick Atkinson's trilogy uh, on the Second World War, and it's been a fascinating read. It's a very detailed read, but lots and lots of interesting facts and anecdotes, and it uh, takes it all the way from the first invasion of North Africa in 1942 through the campaign in Europe. So uh, if you're a history buff at all or interested in that period of time, it's a great read. It's a must read. Okay. And then my favorite question, because I think it's very telling, what would your wife say is the most annoying thing about you? Probably forgetting things that I should remember that she's asked me to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a battle in our house, too. Okay, Rebecca, your turn. Are you ready? Okay, sure, sure, sure. Okay, I know you're very family-oriented, so what's your favorite activity to do with your husband and, and kiddos? Oh, I would say my kids are at an age where they really like to be outside. So taking them outside, playing outside, taking them on walks, going to the pool. That's, like, really, really fun what we like to do. Okay. Um, what is the radio station that you have on your car on the way to work? Oh, gosh, well, I'm kind of a channel flipper, so I'll listen to just about all of them on my way in. Okay. Anything in particular? Oh, I do like some, um, like, pop in the morning, you know, rock and pop in the morning. Get you woken yep. up. Okay. Yep. What's your favorite Janesville restaurant? Oh, that's a hard one, but I would have to say El Hardini on the south side. Okay. And similar, best thing about your job? You know, I got into public service because I really wanted to help people. I wanted to know that the work I did was, you know, helping people have a better life. And every day at JTS, when I answer the phone or talk to people and I see that the service we're providing, you know, gets them to a job interview or gets them to their new job, it just makes me feel like the work that I do is important in helping others. Okay. And then, and then the same question, so what's the most annoying thing about Dave? Just kidding. <laughs> what would your husband say is the most annoying thing about you? <laughs> oh, let's see. I would say he probably would say I'm a bit of a neat nick. So sometimes what I consider a mess, he considers to be a project. And so then I like to clean up his project before he is necessarily done with it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good one. So do you guys have any final thoughts that, that we didn't cover that you think our viewers should, should know? Well, one thing I will say, a few years ago, a gentleman actually wrote an article about the Janesville Transit System in a magazine called Motor Coach Age, and I believe they have a copy of that here at the Hedberg Public Library. And so if you want to read all the nitty-gritty history of the Janesville Transit System, it's available in, in that article. Awesome. Okay, for those history buffs at home. That's right. Okay, great. Well... Thank you so much, Dave and Rebecca, for your time this afternoon. Um, I know I learned a lot about the Janesville Transit System, and I hope that our viewers at home did as well. Folks at home, thank you for tuning in, and I hope you continue to tune in to Park Place Views on a monthly basis. But there's other ways you can stay connected with the city of Janesville on a more day-to-day -day basis. You can like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. You can sign up to receive alerts from the police department on Nixle. Or, as Rebecca mentioned during this interview, you can sign up for um, our press releases and notifications about snow emergencies, road closures, program cancellations, and much more. Um, and those come through your email, and you can sign up at our website slash email lists. So thanks again for watching Park Place Views today, and be sure to tune in next month when my counterpart, Carly Seward, will be sitting down with Ryan Garcia, the Economic Development Coordinator for the City of Janesville, and they'll be talking about the Rock Renaissance Arise Project, which is the um, Downtown Riverfront Action Strategy Development Project, so be sure to check that out. For Park Place Views and the City of Janesville, Wisconsin's Park Place, I'm Maggie Herdlicka. Thanks for watching. <music>